Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. We are back with another episode of Daily Palantir. It has been a long time since I posted an episode. Uh, really, it's been a week, and the reason I have not posted an episode in a week, even though this was one of the most monumental weeks for Palantir, I think in Palantir's history, is because uh, I've been streaming every day for like almost nine hours, and I think my executive decision is that we're just going to go fucking live all day, dude. I think that's it. I think we're fucking doing it. First of all, it would be fucking legendary. Second of all, <laughs> we can see how Pounder plays out after lunch. Third of all, I just got a Coke Zero. I got some chips. This is my lunch, and we're going to keep the show going on. We're going to keep the show fucking going on, everybody. I ended up going viral on Wall Street Bets. 3% off. 3%. 3%. Holy crap. It's Holy popping. crap. It's popping. Holy it's crap. 4%. Five Holy crap! Percent. I was talking to Dan Ives. We started to do all the due diligence and then all talking to all these customers in the fall. It, it was just clear from a use case perspective, the boot camps and what they were doing. And two days ago, I officially lost my voice. As you can see, my voice is cracking as I'm speaking because last night I lost my voice. And that's why, <laughs> that's why <laughs> this week has just been insane. I mean, I'm sure you can hear my voice. That's why I was a little bit late. I was just clearing up my voice before we got ready for the market open. I didn't want to sound ridiculously bad, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, I mean, look, th th this week has been so crazy. I tried to call my girlfriend last night and we couldn't be on the phone for more than 10 minutes because I could not talk. Like I have just lost my voice talking about Palantir. So I'm here on a Sunday and now it is time to discuss what has happened in Palantir's Q4 earnings. Obviously, if you've been part of the channel, if you followed me on Twitter, you have kept up with everything that's gone on. If you've been part of the live streams, which we've had, you know, a bunch of people that have been with me pretty much throughout the entire day, every day for the past five days, uh, we have looked at Palantir stock go from $19 all the way to $25.12. And it's been basically staring tick by tick by tick and seeing the momentum as it keeps going higher and higher and higher. And it's been very exciting. It's more exciting, quite frankly, than anything that's on Netflix. It's been a fun week, but I haven't been able to actually sit down, do a proper video, give all my thoughts, give sort of the core things I'm thinking about, not in terms of just the stock running up 45%, but in terms of the sentiment that has changed for Palantir, the company itself. And in this video, Sunday afternoon, right before the Super Bowl, hope you guys enjoy. Let's get into it. So I'm going to start off with some of my high level overview thoughts on Palantir, their Q4 earnings, and then we'll get deeper into about five or six metrics that I want to discuss. This quarter was a turning point, and I believe an inflection point for Palantir. Over the past couple of years, as we've been covering the company, the core thing we've all kind of had of our, on our minds is that, you know, we love the company, we love the management, we love the CEO, we love how um, arrogant they are, how much bravado they have, how much cockiness they have. It's kind of like you want to bet on those guys that just believe in themselves and have a history of proving they can get the job done. As we've been believing in that sort of optimistic understanding and that that ethos, that persona of what Palantir represented, this, this company that just felt like it was different, the thing we've been waiting for is the business growth, the business results, the ability for them to prove that the philosophical foundation of their company has the business execution side of it so that there can actually be shareholder value. And this quarter, to me, proved that I think we're getting to the point where Palantir, the company, is not just the philosophy anymore. But it's a philosophy that is now being proved by the numbers and Wall Street is taking notice. The reason for that is because 70% U.S. commercial growth, the metric that really matters in the context of where Palantir's growth is going to be, especially when it comes to AIP, is booming. They're guiding for 40% growth. And we'll go deeper into the metrics later. But the fact that that number was shown on these Q4 earnings, the fact that that kind of was the, the core point that I think a lot of the analyst notes that upgraded the stock after the earnings report came out and we'll look at all their price targets said, hey, yeah, it's hard to deny. You know, you got Brent Thill, our, our boy from Jefferies, who downgraded it to 13 two weeks ago, now upgraded it to 22 two weeks later. And I think that one metric was a core selling point for ultimately why he realized that he can't simply have a sell rating uh, on this stock. It's getting to a point where I believe Wall Street is recognizing that Palantir is not just a profitable company which is you know, phenomenal job in 2023. They completely pivoted to going for profitability. But they're a profitable company that is at the cutting edge of implementing enterprise AI into companies. Enterprise AI platforms are gonna be incredibly valuable and incredibly important over the next decade. And if NVIDIA gives us any source of an understanding, even if NVIDIA stock might've run up a little bit over the past couple of weeks, that GPU demand is real, AI demand is real, and that we are truly in a revolution in terms of what it what it comes to accelerated computing and how AI can boost productivity, then Palantir is going to be a major player. Palantir is going to absolutely be a company that is vital 
across this entire industry. And it seems like they were able to basically say, yeah, we don't just think that's going to happen. We think the numbers are justifying why that's going to happen. And you have a chance to get into the company before this thing really takes off. Okay, so let's discuss the stock real quick and then we'll get into the metrics that I care about in the context of the business and how Pounder the business is doing. Stock action has just been, I mean, out of this world. I don't think any of us expected uh, 16 to 24. Uh, most price targets from analysts said maybe 22, 23 by the end of the year. And right now we're at 24, 12. So what I want to talk about real quick is just, is this sustainable or not? I made a post about this on Twitter. At the end of the day, I think the volume we got was institutional. So we had 420 million shares, then 250 million shares, then 200 million shares, then Friday dried up a little bit, dried up at 150 million shares. That volume coming down is not necessarily good for Pounder because they have 2 billion shares outstanding. The percentage of the amount of people buying up the float needs a lot of volume in order for the stock price, obviously, to move higher. And so if that volume dries up, meaning earnings hype kind of dies down and, you know, it just doesn't have as much excitement as it had this week, then we could see a bit of retracement uh, in the stock price. In the context of institutional investors, we did see that the institutional float, I believe, went up from 39.3 to 40%, if I'm not wrong on that. So we did see an increase in institutional investors buying the stock. Kathy Wood obviously bought 2 million shares, and their reasoning for it was just that AIP is growing. They want to bet on a company that is reaccelerating their AI growth, and uh, they do believe that Palantir is going to be a pivotal platform for many enterprises. So the institutional argument to buy Palantir is now pretty obvious, gap profitable, really not likely to go bankrupt, whereas Back at six, seven dollars when really was the time to invest. Obviously, the risk was a lot higher. And so the toots ended up waiting. So I don't believe, and I could be wrong about this, but I I don't know if now at this price, Pound had a $55 billion market cap doing about $200 million in profit, 2.7 billion ish in revenue. A conventional institution would look at that and be like, that's that's a little bit pricey, right? Now, obviously, when Snowflake is a $76 billion company, NVIDIA is at one, almost $2 trillion. Like you, when you when you do a peer-to-peer -peer comparison, Palantir looks kind of cheap just from a market cap perspective. But as those companies potentially pull back, which we'll talk about in a bit, that could end up hurting Palantir. I think most of the institutional investors that wanted to buy last week ended up buying. You know, you, you got in, you saw the numbers, you're like, all right, the numbers are good. We're going to ride this thing to 30, 40, 50, wherever it goes. But now we finally have a chance to participate in Pounder's AI adoption without having to chase Microsoft or NVIDIA's AI plays. Pounder is obviously much cheaper than those on a market cap basis, maybe not on a PE basis. Um, I don't know if that volume continues. I don't know if retail um, yeah, volume continues. I don't know if a lot of day traders that came into the stock this week and got excited about it are going to care and they might just end up leaving. They might take their losses. They might take their profits. If you have a $17 average stock goes from 24 to 21, you're like, you know what? I don't really care about Pounder. I'm going to take my profits and leave. A lot of that can happen. A general market pullback can happen. The S&P 500 is at 500, right? We're at an all-time high. QQQ at an all-time high. IWM, the Russell Index, which are small caps, were supposed to be going higher. That was the narrative going into this year. And all that money has flowed into the large caps. So if the large caps take a little bit of a break, that might money might end up going into the small caps. And, you know, maybe Pounder takes a break with it. I'm not sure what's going to happen over the next couple of weeks. I'll be covering it every single day. But it, it just seems like there is a world in which 45% in a week is not sustainable, particularly because we've seen this happen many times. In the summer, we saw Pounder go from about 14 to 20, pulled right back down to 13. Then we saw this happen again in November. We went from about 1480 to 2185. Then we pulled right back to 1565 over the next coming month. If that price action happens, like it happened before, not to mention the insiders have sold. These are scheduled sales. I'll talk about it in a separate episode, but like we have had almost 2 million shares sold by insiders over the past week. Um, then that could be a little bit of a problem for Palantir in its attempt to keep going higher and higher, especially if the price action follows the same price action that has happened every single time we've had a run. Now, I do think there can be a new floor to the stock. I think 16, 17 is not going to be that easy to get back to this time. Maybe 18, 19 is the floor. $20 is the floor. So we go from 24 to 20, which is still a phenomenal earnings to go from 16 to 20. You know, 16 to 24 is amazing. 16 to 20 is still really good. And then we capitulate there, trade sideways until the next earnings where, you know, hopefully the macro is in a very good situation. Inflation is coming down. Interest rates are likely going to be cut around the corner in June. Uh, usually we have earnings in May. And then Pounder puts a good numbers and we make our next leg higher and then we can stay at 25 versus 25 seeming absurd don't know what's going to happen but it does seem like this price action has gotten ahead of itself i think we can all agree this is a lot in just a week and usually when that happens the euphoria is high it's super exciting i'm obviously super excited on the live stream i'm acting like an auctioneer can we get 24 5 24 6 like it's fun it's a fun journey. It's a fun game. But we all also know that things do come back down and we have to be very prepared for those things to come down. So my advice, quite frankly, is 
I have come to the conclusion that I just want to hold Palantir for a very long time. And I don't really care. I did have some options on it. I sold some of those options live. I made like 1300 bucks and the initial we're taking from those options. I'm just throwing it back into stock. So next week on the market open at some price, we're just going to dump that 2000 bucks into the stock. But I've come to the conclusion at this point, given the numbers, I just want to go long. I've always had the conclusion. I want to go long. Now I really have come to the conclusion where I don't know where the stock's going to go up or down. If it goes back to 16, I'll buy more. If it stays at 23 for the next two months, I'll buy more at 23. It just, has made me feel that, you know what? I think this company is really on the trajectory that they're supposed to be on. And I want to just keep holding and accumulating for a very long time. Alex Carp in the earnings call, we'll talk more about this in future episodes, but he was phenomenal. I mean, he was absolutely incredible. His, his demeanor, his excitement, his ability to convey a message. It's, it just makes you so grateful for investing in a CEO like that. I think this is company's a very, very long-term hold. I know I've said that for a long time, but finally the business numbers have justified why it's worth holding it which means it can have a lot of volatility to the downside or the upside, but I'm not excited to sell at 25 when I think this thing can be much higher than that uh, years from now. And I'm definitely, you know, not scared to add on any dips in 21, 22, 20, because at this point the numbers prove that this is real AI is happening and we should probably, you know, take advantage of different opportunities we get. So uh, my, 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 my thesis here is that if you're going to DCA, I wouldn't go balls deep at 24, 25 at, at 52, we cut like, that's probably not what you want to do, especially given the price action we've seen before in the past, but you also don't want to be afraid, uh, for it to come down to 16, 17, because the business has fundamentally changed this quarter, which we'll talk about in the metrics are real in, in, in it was real in terms of how you should think about the actual growth trajectory. They put up the numbers and when they put up the numbers, valuations have to change. And if valuations have to change, that's okay. Because that means the upside for the stock also has to change. So like if you have to buy it a little bit higher and not have to wait for, you know, a $12, $13 price target that, that people are waiting for, that's okay as well. As long as there really is a long-term mentality, because you could be negative on those shares, you could be positive on the shares to me at this point it's going to be a fun five, six, seven years just letting this whole thing play out. And so those are my thoughts on the stock and uh, we'll end up seeing where it goes over the next few weeks. All right, let's get into the metrics that I want to talk about. These are some really, really cool metrics that I've seen this week on their earnings. And I think these metrics kind of show that Palantir has officially made a change in their company. We have uh, total revenue growth, 20% year over year, 9% quarter over quarter. Very, very exciting to see that revenue growth. Obviously that revenue growth uh, was driven by the continued acceleration of their U.S. commercial business. They put up the numbers. They are guiding for 20% year-over-year growth as well at about $2.685 billion. I do think they are sandbagging on those numbers, and that's probably going to be closer to 22 to 23% as the U.S. commercial business continues to accelerate. But that right there was what we needed to see. Analysts thought they would come in with $602 million. They came in with 608 beat expectations there, and they continue to be gap profitable. Commercial revenue growth, 32% year-over-year. Phenomenal. U.S. commercial revenue growth, 70% year-over-year. So, I mean, as we can see, obviously we have a business that is starting to grow uh, in a very sophisticated way when it comes to U.S. commercial. If we just subtract commercial from U.S. commercial, that means we are doing $153 million internationally. Uh, obviously that $153 million internationally commercial is not growing at 70% the way U.S. commercial is growing. Now, this is okay because this is what Carp and company have said the business should be judged on, how well they can grow in U.S. commercial, particularly with their new AIP product, because that is the product in terms of implementing large language models that every single enterprise in the world is trying to figure out how they can use to make their company more efficient, have better revenue, have better margins, and cut costs. And so if U.S. commercial is experiencing this much demand, they conducted close to 600 boot camps last year, which is, you know, they did like 90 pilots in February 2022. It's a massive increase in the boot camps. If they just scaled the boot camps by 20 to 30 percent for full year 2024, you are going to have a lot more customer conversion on those boot camps, which means U.S. commercial revenue is just going to continue to grow. They're guiding for 40 percent year over year growth. It's going to be really exciting to see what ends up happening here. Uh, during Q4 2023, we closed 103 deals of at least 1 million. 37 were 5 million, 21 were 10 million. Why is this important? Because they only added about um, 45 customers, I believe. We'll, we'll check it out in a second, but about 45 net new customers. So if that's the case, uh, yeah, 44 customers. If that's the case, if they only added 44 customers, but they did 103 deals, then that means that uh, 59 of those deals were with existing clients. And we did see the net dollar retention go up from 107% to 108%. I think it'll take a few more quarters for the monetization to play out. And then that should get back closer to the 120s like it was about a year ago. But the fact is they are closing deals, not just with brand new clients, but with existing clients, which means they're going to those clients and saying, hey, 
here's what we have to offer. Here's why you should really be using it. If you're already using Foundry, you should be using AIP, maybe even to their government clients as well. And that's why Palantir is getting more momentum in terms of the growth. Now, this was my favorite metric. Uh, this is a metric that I was a sucker for. Adjusted operating income margin hit a bottom at Q3 2022 at uh, 17%. This was the quarter where Carp said they wouldn't be profitable till 2025. And it was just one of the worst quarters Palantir ever had. That is more than doubled from 18 or doubled from 18 months ago, 17 to 34. And it's up 5% quarter over quarter. This is really important. You need a good adjusted operating income margin to be able to sustain the actual money coming from the business itself that ends up going back to free cash flow, going back, going back to the money that Pound2 is going to be keeping on their balance sheet. Like we need to make sure that margin is higher and higher. And as a software company, you need that margin to be high because that's what investors are paying for. That there's a fixed cost to doing your business because you make very good software. That software ends up scaling, which means if you do incremental changes to the software, the margin should go up. That's the whole benefit of investing in SaaS plays. And then if you can grow top line growth, you have this amazing reoccurring revenue at these fantastic margins, which is why investors are able and willing to pay the multiple for the stock. So that metric going up was also very exciting to me. And it means that uh, Palantir is becoming more fiscally responsible in terms of how they can conduct business growth and uh, margin growth on the actual income from operations. Q4 2023, 3.7 billion in cash. We went from 3.3 billion to 3.7 billion. I do not think they're going to do a buyback uh, with this money. A lot of people are saying, hey, they should do a buyback. I vehemently disagree. They don't need to do a buyback. It's not going to reduce the float. Uh, they need to take that money, invest it into R&D, or just continue co to collect the juicy treasury income uh, from short-term T-bills. And those T-bills should help them sustain gap profitability. Palantir was $93 million of net income this quarter, up from $71 million last quarter, which means the rate of growth in the net income is about 29%, which is higher than the rate of growth over of, of, of revenue, which is at about 20%, which means we're starting to see some leverage in terms of the business if they can expand the actual margins on profitability, even if top line revenue growth is not growing the same as uh, net income margin. So very exciting to see that the fact that net income is going up, adjusted uh, cash from operations and adjusted free cash flow was $305 million with a 50% margin in Q4 2023. So all in all, I mean, $3.7 billion in cash. It's one of the most pristine balance sheets on the market. No debt. Very, very excited to make sure that Pouncher sustains this momentum with their cash pile. And really, it's, it takes away a lot of fear in terms of the company and, you know, going bankrupt, just giving, given the fact that they have so much cash, if anything ever happens, they are ready to go and they can deploy it at any, at any moment. Uh, finally, this was the one metric that wasn't the best government revenue growth. It's up 11% year over year, US government growth only up 6%. I believe, and this is kind of what I predicted before the earnings, that the government growth will eventually reaccelerate. It's going to take time for it to reaccelerate, but we need to have uh, U.S. commercial booming so that we can subsidize the lack of government revenue growth. And then once that revenue growth comes in, Sham Sankar posted yesterday that, you know, the DOD is only spending 0.015% of their budget on software. That goes up to 0.6%, 0.7%, eventually gets to 1%. Pounter is going to be in the running to get a lot of that money. And we know that billions need to be spent on AI, machine learning, advanced operational metrics when it comes to the military, the DOD, not just in the United States, but all across the world. And so Pound2 was pretty clear on their government business and their international government business on the earnings call when they were asked about it. They said it's going to take some time. That's eventually going to reaccelerate. But their U.S. commercial business is leading the growth. And as long as that continues growing, it gives the company more time to figure out the stuff that's not growing, which we believe, I believe they're going to, they're going to be able to figure out. I mean, no one thought Pound2 was going to be able to sell their software in 2022. Now you have boot camps and they are pioneering how to sell software via the product. And uh, I think they're going to figure out the government growth as well, especially given we know there's an appetite for their software all across the world. So in general, I mean, this was one of the most exciting earnings that I think any of us ever have ever seen when it comes to Palantir. And the stock market has reflected uh, why their earnings deserve a bit of a bump. Finally, this is what we got from analysts on the street. Uh, Jeffries. $22 price target, City, $20, DA Davidson, $19, Deutsche Bank, $18, Wolf Research, $14, B of A Securities, $24, Morgan Stanley, $12, Mizuho, $18, Wedbush, $30, HBHC, $22, Raymond James, $25. So we got price upgrades across the board. The lowest is Morgan Stanley at $12. City went from $10 to $20. Jeffries went from $13 to $22. City has been one of the more bearish companies they've increase their price targets. And then Jeffries, one of the more bearish companies from 13 to 22. Wedbush, Dan Ives, I did a interview with him. I'll leave it in the description of the day after pound your earnings. He said 25 to 30. And his big thing has been the use cases of AIP are going to keep expanding. And as a result of that, 
the messy of AI is not going to stop anytime soon. Now, RBC, our boy Rishi, still has a $5 price target. Um, I don't know what to tell Rishi. I don't think it's going to get back to $5, but he is the most bearish on the street. Everyone else has basically said, all right, this story is happening. The narrative is here. It's time to upgrade the stock. So this was one of the most exciting quarters in the world of Palantir. Um, this is something that I've been preparing for over the past couple of years. Uh, I didn't expect to happen this quickly in a week, and I'm fully prepared for it to come back in regards to the stock price. But the business is finally not only making sense, but making sense. And if the business is making sense, the numbers are making sense, all the hypothetical speculation we had about can they sell, you know, can they increase the margins, can they penetrate, yada, yada, yada. Some of that speculation exists, especially as we're now trying to become one of the most important software companies in the world. But a lot of the doubt on that speculation has has gone away. And now it's less of a mystery. Now it's a question of can we scale? We got a bunch of partnerships I'll talk about next week as well over the over the week. One in Bahrain with Energy, another one with Voyager, which is a space company. But it just seems like this is Palantir's time to really capture the market. And it is very exciting as a shareholder to be part of this entire journey, seeing them try to capture the market and seeing a management team that is just stellar and just believes in themselves and really just believes they have the best product in the world. They know they have the best product in the world. They have to figure out how to sell. They are starting to sell with their product. And the rest of the world is going to catch up to something that we've been covering for a very long time on this channel. And it's going to be an exciting, exciting next few years to see what ends up happening with Palantir. So thank you for everybody watching this video. Uh, thank you for everyone joining the live streams. We had 5,200 people on the Pounter earnings live stream. That was more than Pounter had on their own channel, which was just insane. And, uh, you know, people stayed and watched a bunch of retail investors give their thoughts and analysis about Pounter. And that's, that means a lot. That really, 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 really means a lot, especially in the context of where we started this journey when it was $6. And, you know, a lot of people, there was just a lot of hate on YouTube and Twitter and everyone saying, why are you so obsessed with this company? It's like, dude, I don't know. I just, the company is very interesting to me. They said the word ontology on their website back in uh, 2021. Obviously, now we all know what a ontology is, but I studied debate in high school. And, you know, I was like, well, ontology is really interesting. It's a philosophical term. You, this is the first thing you learn when you sign up for the debate team. You learn about these core philosophical concepts. And when they said the data of your company is an ontology, immediately it struck my attention November 2021. I was like, that's really interesting. And you just go deeper, deeper, deeper. You learn about CARP. You see him talk about Western values and protecting democracy and all this stuff. And then what the company stands for, the tech moat behind them, 20 years, Peter Thiel, zero to one. It just becomes one of the most interesting companies in the world to make content about, to cover, and to support. And I've been, I've been happy to play my role along this journey as we've uh, seen Palantir continue to do what it's been able to do. And it's really fun to see the street finally react to it, you know? And that doesn't mean the, the stock won't come back down again, but it does mean that something you've been thinking about for years has finally been reflected in terms of how Wall Street understands the narrative um, as we've all been looking at this narrative for the past couple of years. So really, really exciting stuff. Thank you everybody for being here. I will see you guys on the next episode of Daily Pound Tour. Sorry I couldn't put out, post any episodes this whole week. It's just been a very busy week, but we'll be here. Live streams, market open. Check them out, 8.45 to about 10.30 a.m. Uh, market closes 3.45 to about 5 p.m. every single day. And uh, we will keep doing it and covering the company that has captured all of our imaginations and see what ends up happening from here. Dailypoundtier.substack.com, free email newsletter. Check it out. Free to subscribe. Thank you all for being here. I'll see you in the next one. 96 21 91 okay we're gonna do it now we're gonna do it now here we go boom let's see what happens this is amit manipulating the market 21 93 baby sec i was just kidding please don't take that seriously all right that's the one share rule we did the one share now all we got to do is let the magic of the one share do its thing and push us over the hump that's it that's it it's and there we go baby 22. There we go. It pushed us over the hump because it's Wednesday and that's hump day. That's what I'm talking about. $22.12. $22.12. I told you we got to push it over the hump. It was flirting with 22, but that one share just really gets it over 22, up 1.23%. Let's keep this fucking going, dude. Fuck 17. Fuck 18. We are in the roaring 20s, even if we are not roaring kitties. $22.20 up 1.5%. Momentum is there. 